Okay, well, it is 11 o'clock. Let's go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to our first fall meeting press briefing. This is Drought 2021. I'm Lauren LaPuma from the AGU Press Office, and I'll be moderating the briefing today. So our panelists today are Kelsey Sadolino from NOAA's National Integrated Drought Information System and Mark Svo Svo oh, excuse me, Svoboda from the National Drought Mitigation Center at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. We also have Adam Lang, also from the National Integrated Drought Information System, who is here to help with questions, although he won't be presenting. So information for reporters who are attending. So the slides from this presentation are going to be available after the press briefing ends in the Fall Meeting Media Center. And there's a link right there. And uh, my colleague Liza will put that link into the chat box for you. And a recording of this event will be posted to AGU's YouTube channel later today. And it will be up there for the duration of the meeting. If you'd like to refer back to it, um, the playlist will be, under, it will be under the playlist, Fall Meeting 2020 Press Conferences. So after the presenters give their presentations, we are going to have time for formal questions. But then afterwards, we will have an informal 30 minute discussion room via Zoom. So if you wanna stick around and talk to the panelists a little more, um, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them, you can join this discussion room. We will post the link to it in this event's chat box in this of this webinar. And um, the meeting ID is right there and the passcode is AGU Press. And if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat box or you can email us at news at agu.org and we'll get back to you right away. So we'll begin with the panelists giving brief um, presentations, describing their work, and then we'll open it up to questions from reporters. So now I'll turn it over to our panelists. Mark, go ahead. Thanks, Lauren. Good day, everybody. My name is Mark Sabota, and I'm the director of the National Drought Mitigation Center located here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, today, I'd like to <clears throat> speak to you a little bit about what we've been seeing as far as drought is concerned in 2020, and then taking a look at what prospects are for 2021. Next slide. So this is the current snapshot of drought across the United States. Uh, this is the US Drought Monitor dated December 1st. You can see a good portion of the United States, uh, just under half to be exact, 48% in some form of drought but notice the extensive uh, red and dark brownish red colors in the West Four Corners region, Intermountain West and part of the plains in uh, Pacific Northwest. We're seeing a substantial amount of what we call extreme or exceptional drought, which is uh, droughts you typically would see on the order of once every 20 to 50 years. Uh, we're also seeing some significant lingering drought in the Hawaiian Island chain. Next slide. This map shows the difference between the drought monitor dated December 1st and what the drought monitor looked like back in summer. We've seen a significant increase, uh, three to five class category degradation. Uh, the drought has expanded and intensified uh, primarily over the Western half of the United States, west of the Mississippi. And again, primarily over that Four Corners region and parts of the Central and High Plains. Next slide. Just to put some firm numbers on this, uh, as I mentioned earlier, just under half of the US is in some form of drought, which starts at D1, uh, between D1 and D4. Uh, if you go back to the beginning of the year, you'll see that number was barely over 10% at just over 11. But pay attention to the, uh, the D3, D4 columns there on the right in the red and the brown. This shows that at the beginning of the year, we virtually had no extreme or exceptional drought anywhere in the country, at least in the lower 48 states. And now we've ramped up to about 21% in, in the uh, extreme category and just under 10% in the exceptional category. Uh, these are numbers we haven't seen since 2012, the significant drought that, that uh, covered uh, about two thirds of the country. Um, and right now we see just under 72 million uh, people falling in those affected areas of drought. Next slide. One of the things we'll definitely be keeping an eye on, and I'm going to show you a slide next that shows the pattern uh, expected for this winter, is, is snowpack and snow water equivalent to be exact. How much water is in that snow? Uh, what we might expect to see uh, during a typical La Nina winter. 
You see a lot of oranges and reds again in the Four Corners region, Central and Southern Rockies, and uh, the Southern Sierra Nevadas. This is only two months into the water year, so obviously quite early, plenty of time to go. But when you see some of the patterns we see to be projected, uh, this area bears watching to see if we're going to get mm -hmm. significant water supply mm -hmm. recharge during the, mm -hmm. the fall period. Next mm -hmm. slide, please. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned earlier, now, uh, La Nina conditions are present. And that means that if you look at the bottom left, uh, this blue blob there uh, signifies cooler than average sea surface temperatures, anywhere from about a half a degree to one and a half degrees below normal. Uh, this cool pool is expanded west, uh, uh, westward across the equator towards Australia and started uh, in the late summer, early fall period, and it continues to push and intensify. So we, right now, if you look at the top right, this is a typical pattern you would expect to see with La Nina in place, and that is the prospects for cooler and wetter weather across the northern tier states whereas you would expect to see warmer and drier conditions across the southern tier states from Southern California, across the Gulf Coast, and even into the Southeast, including the coastal Carolinas. That likelihood of, of happening is still remains quite high through the uh, February, March, April timeframe at an 80% probability. Um, so we expect this pattern to persist. Next slide. More specifically, what does that mean for, let's look at temperature first over this, uh, through the February of 2021 period, pretty pronounced uh, dichotomy here between uh, cooler temperatures uh, being projected in the north, specifically across the US-Canada border over uh, from Washington to Minnesota. But notice the uh, amount of orange and red in the Southern tier states, coast to coast, uh, signifying a, a above normal probabilities of above normal uh, temperatures. Same goes for Hawaii, where there's a strong signal there to see the temperatures continue to be above normal between now and the end of February of 21. Next slide. Looking at precipitation, um, again, consistent with the La Nina pattern predicted by the Climate Prediction Center uh, within NOAA, you expect wetter conditions across the northern tier states from the Pacific Northwest to the Great Lakes uh, over most of the Hawaiian island chain, uh, significantly higher probabilities of above normal or wetter than normal conditions. And conversely, in the south, you see the prospects, and this is why I showed that snowpack, snow water equivalent slide, you see the prospects increase for below normal precipitation coast to coast from Southern California over into the Southeast, again, through the February 21 timeframe. Hawaii may expect to see some improvement though during this La Nina pattern. Next slide. What does this mean for the drought monitor that I showed you in the first slide dated December 1st? Well, this uh, seasonal drought outlook produced by the Climate Prediction Center takes the current drought monitor and anticipates how that might change between now in the end of February. So for the next 90 days, the seasonal drought outlook product shows all those area in red, we expect drought to persist. Across the Northern tier states that we talked about earlier, we see some chance for drought removal or certainly some improvement from parts of the Pacific Northwest into central Montana and then up in the Northeast and New England region. Also note, uh, the uh, increased chances or odds here in the yellow areas defined as where drought development is likely. Again, due to that La Nina winter pattern, we expect drought to expand uh, eastward and intensify perhaps as well. And we hope that drought, as we see here for Hawaii, uh, abates. Next slide. So one of the big stories this year obviously has been fire. Uh, California is going to go down with its largest wildfire season on record um, with over 4 million acres burned uh, already and, and recent flare ups again, if you've been watching the news here in uh, the US. And unfortunately, with that La Nina pattern, you saw the prospects for drier, warmer weather. You get the Santa Ana winds on that and conditions are ripe to uh, spill over with significant fire potential into 2021. These maps on the right in red show on the top from December through March on the bottom, 
those areas in red are where we expect that significant fire potential to uh, expand. So it's going to push eastward along with that La Nina pattern of warmer, drier winter weather, less precip, warmer temperatures. Um, that could spell some issues for fire pushing east into spring of 2021. Next slide. So some wrap up points here. I've already touched on the numbers above this again, the most drought we've seen since 2012. Um, with that La Nina event, we expect the drought to continue to push east and intensify across the Southern, steer, southern tier states. Uh, we'll be keeping a, a close eye on the snowpack and water supply situation in the West as the Colorado is such a vital lifeline for uh, dry season delivery of water, irrigation and urban supply. Uh, this will be critical uh, going forward, as is the temperature signal, because we'd prefer that pack to stay and melt out slowly. So warmer temperatures enhance the water moving through the cycle, puts a, puts a stronger strain on the water resource when it doesn't stay up there in cold temperatures and in the form of snow. And finally, um, La Nina will obviously continue to uh, exacerbate the fire season here. Um, it seems like we don't get much of a break as we head into 21, and uh, we can expect that to push east as well, uh, following that same La Nina pattern I spoke of at the top of the presentation. Next slide. So this is my contact information. I know we'll have some chat and Q&A after my talk, but feel free to also reach uh, out to me offline via my email here. And I thank you for your time and attention. And at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Kelsey with the National Integrated Drought Information System to talk to you all about a real uh, new exciting launch that's coming early next year. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kelsey, as Mark mentioned, I'm with the National Integrated Drought Information System or NIDIS. And now that we've talked a little bit about um, drought this year and looking into 2021, I wanna take a moment to showcase uh, a sneak preview of the new US drought portal, uh, www.drought.gov. NIDIS has been working on redesigning the US drought portal to be an even better resource um, for monitoring, predicting, planning for, and reporting on drought and its impacts. So I'm gonna share my screen and give you a, a sneak preview of the new drought portal, which will be launched in early January. So, all right. Um, so uh, during this brief demo, I wanna showcase three new features of the brand new drought.gov that will be launched soon. The first is the ability to view drought conditions on a, a much higher resolution down to the city and county level. The interactive data and maps throughout the website that are easily shareable um, as a new way to find and share information on drought and our brand new by sector section. Um, which shows droughts impacts on different economic sectors. The first new feature I want to zoom in on is the ability to view drought conditions at a higher resolution than we have offered on drought.gov before. On the current drought.gov, users can view drought conditions down to the state level. However, on the new drought.gov, users can enter a zip code or their city and be taken to a location page that provides up-to-date drought conditions down to the city level. Um, the charts and maps on these pages are interactive, showing current conditions, key indicators of drought, outlooks and forecasts, and historical drought conditions, which I will come back to and talk about more in a little bit. I'm actually gonna jump to the Lubbock County page here to show you how easy it is to jump between different geographic scales when looking at drought conditions. Um, you'll notice throughout the new website, we have these blue boxes with quick statistics. Um, these are meant to provide a quick high level snapshot of current drought conditions, um, as well as the ability to compare current conditions with historical conditions for that region. And that you can go to these pages for any county within the United States. Um, these pages also showcase current conditions, 
um, from the US drought monitor, as well as temperature and precipitation conditions. Um, users can zoom in with these maps. Most of the maps on these pages are completely interactive. You can easily select a different county to jump to information for that county and view quick statistics about the percentage of a given region that is in drought. I also want to highlight um, several maps on these pages show the impacts of drought on different economic sectors. So for example, maps showing crops and livestock in drought, um, water supply conditions and droughts impacts on water supply. For example, we're showcasing uh, stream flow levels with interactive links to jump to the US Geological Survey information for each stream flow gauge, as well as public health information. Um, we're also showcasing um, outlooks and forecasts about atmospheric evaporative demand or the thirst of the atmosphere, which can be a key indicator of drought, as well as uh, monthly and seasonal drought outlooks from NOAA's Climate Prediction Center and historical information. Users can view uh, drought information at a variety of different scales. So whatever geographic region you may be reporting on, whether that's at the city, county, state, regional, national, or international level, it's really easy to zoom in on the exact region that you're looking for and view up-to-date drought information, both current conditions, outlooks and forecasts, and historical information. Another key feature of the new drought.gov that I want to highlight are the interactive data and maps throughout the website. So if, say, you were reporting on a specific region and wanted to know how a current drought compares to historical drought information in that region, our historical data and conditions page um, is a great resource. This page showcases three different historical drought data sets side by side in a really visual and interactive way. Um, we have the US Drought Monitor, as Mark mentioned in his presentation, going back to the year 2000, standardized precipitation index, going back to the year 1895, and paleoclimate data, which uses tree ring reconstructions combined with instrumental data to estimate the drought conditions each summer, going back to the year zero for some regions of the United States. You can easily toggle between different data sets, zoom in on a specific time period, or move this cursor to select a specific time. And the map below and these statistics in the legend so showing the percentage of the US in varying stages of drought will update automatically. Um, you can zoom in or out of this map, select a specific state to load historical information for that state. And all of this graph, statistics, and map will update automatically. You can even zoom in to the county level. Um, so you're again able to view this historical drought information at a much higher resolution. Once you've found the information that you're looking for, it's easy to download a screenshot of the map for sharing and to learn more about the different data sets and download the data for yourself. We have a lot of different data and maps on the new drought portal, um, which I won't have time to show you today. But one final section that I wanna show you is our new by sector section. Based on user research, um, we wanted to provide landing pages for people who work within dif different economic sectors, as well as those reporting on droughts impacts on different economic sectors, to provide a one-stop shop for background information on resources um, on droughts impacts on those sectors. Each of these bisector pages begins with a featured map or maps showcasing relevant information for that sector related to drought. And in many of these maps, we show uh, drought information from different partners and different data sources shown together to view drought in a new way. For example, on our wildfire management page, um, we show the current US drought monitor drought designations overlaid with current active wildfires. You can view, view both of those data sets together. Each of these sector pages also contains a brief summary of key issues for drought in that sector as well as a more in-depth background on droughts impacts on that sector. Finally, each sector page contains a curated list of resources for drought early warning for that economic sector. Overall, uh, the new drought portal allows you to view and share up-to-date drought information, maps, and tools, whether you want to look at drought by topic, by location, down to the city and county level, or by economic sector. 
Um, but drought.gov is an integrated drought information portal that allows you to easily find and share the information you need to report on drought conditions and to help communities better mitigate and, um, mitigate and plan for the impacts of drought. Um, we're going to be launching the new drought portal in early January and we welcome your questions and feedback. You can reach out to us at drought.portal at noaa.gov and I will put that email in the chat as well. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Kelsey and Mark. Um, so we are now going to open it up for questions. So reporters, you aren't able to speak because we're in a webinar platform. So if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box, not the chat box, the Q&A box. And my colleague Liza will pose it to the panel on your behalf. Um, and after the formal question period is over, we are going to open up a 30 minute informal discussion room in Zoom so that um, you can speak directly to the panelists and for the talk, have more of a discussion if you'd like, talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and so the link to that discussion room is in the chat box. But for now, if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A box and we'll get started. No questions yet, so we'll just give everyone a few minutes to gather their thoughts. All right, this question is for Kelsey. It's coming from Megan Sever. Are we able to explore the website before the January launch? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I might let Adam handle that one, um, but you can reach out to us at um, drought.portal at noaa.gov if, you, if you'd like more information on the launch a little bit more in depth before um, we launch the website, something that I haven't covered in this demo. I think you're on mute, Adam. Better. Uh, thanks for the question, Megan. We will check and get back to you. Um, we need to, yeah, just check on a couple things, but we will let you know. And one thing I forgot to mention, reporters, please state your name and uh, your affiliation when you're stating your question. Uh, this question is from freelancer Harvey Leifert. Do you have any comments on the causes of expanding drought aside from La Nina? Um, drought is very difficult to predict. Um, actually, the stronger ENSO event, whether it be um, a cool event like La Nina or a warm event like La, uh, El Nino, gives us a little bit more predictability in general, you know, sort of regionally. But when you get down to real specifics, it really comes down to the weather and the interface between the atmosphere and the ground in any given month or season that really drives, is this drought gonna get worse? Is it gonna get better? As we like to say, all droughts are local. Um, but you know, we know this increasing temperature has a big role in drought and the feedback between a dry soil and a dry atmosphere, that's not a good combination. La Nina generally produces that in, in, across the Southern tier. And keep in mind, we're coming off the driest May through October period and in, in statewide, at least across California, Arizona and New Mexico. And we expect this dryness and warmth to continue to spread east. So that's as good as it gets as far as predictability here in the United States. Other places in the world have a little stronger correlation uh, and can predict drought a little better than we can here in the United States, just because it's a very large country. So it's a very difficult thing to predict, which is why we need to really monitor it diligently. Okay, do we have any more questions? No more questions. Hold on, one more question has popped up. This is coming from Alexander Witze from Nature. For Mark Savoda, can you talk a little more about detecting flash or rapid onset droughts? Are those increasing or is it our ability to detect them that is getting better? Uh, this is a really hot topic. Um, we just had a workshop actually that NIDAS uh, hosted last week. And uh, we had a lot of 
I think, great conversations about this. It's a little bit nascent right now as to what flash drought is. It, it Like drought, drought itself has over 200 definitions. So can we pin one definition on flash drought? Um, but as far as detecting those, yes. Uh, 2012 was a huge, iconic flash drought. Um, that put it on the map. Uh, the term's been around since 2000. Uh, they're just now building a flash drought climatology, which will go to your question about are we seeing these increase or not, or are the characteristics changing? Another thing, as I mentioned in my last question, I think temperature plays a big role on these flash droughts, uh, that and evapotranspiration, and it's the interplay of those that will bear watching. So uh, along those lines, a lot of research, a lot of time and application has been put into developing new tools that can help us detect flash drought. Um, these are centered around things like evapotranspiration, soil moisture, and, and using satellite platforms to augment our in situ networks to do a better job of detecting them earlier. The 2012 drought, there was no forecast for that flash drought that covered, eventually covered two thirds of the country. Um, and, and while this drought hasn't been, you know, covering as much of the country, it has ramped up rather quickly. So using these new tools to detect flash drought, the drought of 2012 maybe took us uh, six to eight weeks to sort of catch up with. With the new tools uh, that look at vegetation stress, evaporative stress, uh, soil moisture stress, we were narrowing that down to just a week or two. So we've really shaved off at least by half the response time to flash drought. So a lot more work to do, a lot more to understand, but uh, it was a very good conversation and, and you should be able to go to drought.gov now in the, in the next few weeks, hopefully, or the next month and see all the outcomes of that flash drought workshop. Thanks for your question. Yeah, I just wanna uh, jump in. Thanks, Mark. Um, as Mark mentioned, we did have a, a three-day virtual flash drought workshop last week, and we'll have a lot of information coming from that um, probably probably towards the uh, beginning of January, and I can reach out to you um, when we have some links up. Question from Peter Sinclair from Yale Climate Connections. There has been a long argument about whether climate change is actually increasing the number of droughts. Has that question been settled or do we still need a longer period of observations? Wow, great question, Peter. Um, yeah, it, to me, it's, it's becoming more and more apparent, readily apparent. I mean, I think there's enough research and literature out there now that shows we should expect an increase. Uh, and, and it's kind of like one of those things where uh, when you talk about climate, you kind of have to look back in the rearview mirror but we're really living it now maybe, right? With, this, with these increased temperatures, the same argument I made for, for flash drought would apply to our traditional droughts too, because flash droughts is speaking more to the rapid onset or intensity. And then these droughts may manifest themselves as hydrological drought or your ordinary sort of drought. So is that tied to that temperature signal? And the, the rapid movement of water through the water cycle, I think can only uh, speak to that, yes, I think droughts are uh, affected by this influence and water is moving through the cycle more quickly. Yes, in a warmer climate, you expect more moisture in the atmosphere, but it's the number of days between droughts. It's the amount that comes when it does rain, which is typically heavier than we've seen. This is bear, borne out through the national climate assessments, as I'm sure you're aware, Peter. And um, so, yeah, I think we're living it right now and we're probably right on the precipice of being able to say, yeah, now we can look back 20 years and say, this has really changed the behavior of droughts since the turn of the century. Um, so I, I'm, I'm in that camp right now. I think we're seeing this. Uh, the only thing we don't have is the full born climatology yet to prove that, but I think that will come soon. Okay, do we have any more questions? Go ahead and type them in. No more questions, Lauren. 
All right, well, that's it. We will conclude our briefing. And so now we will go ahead and open up that discussion room that I mentioned. So if anyone wants to stick around and talk to our panelists a little, in a little more detail, a little more informally, please um, go ahead and join. The link is in the chat um, and the passcode is AGU Press, all lowercase. That's also in the chat box. Um, let us know if you have any questions, but thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to our panelists. And we will resume again at 1 p.m with our first press conference on the impacts of COVID-19 as seen from space. Thank you all for joining us.